In Ephesians chapter 5, we'll begin reading in verse 14. Paul, writing his letter to the church at Ephesus, said this. Ephesians 5, 14. Wherefore he saith, and he's saying what the Holy Spirit's saying. Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly. That means exactly or precisely not as fools but as wise redeeming the time because the days are evil wherefore be ye not unwise but understanding what the will of the Lord is several years later when Paul was on the Isle of Patmos Jesus appeared to him and began to give him an outline of what was going to happen we call it the Revelation. It's the last book in the New Testament. And as he began that revelation of what was going to happen, Jesus gave him seven letters to take to the seven churches that were in Asia. And the first letter that Jesus gave to John was a letter to this same church, the church of the Ephesians or the church at Ephesus. And Jesus commented and complimented them about certain things but then he said I've got something against you because you have left your first love he said repent and do the first works now Paul had warned this body about sleep he said awake thou that sleepest and the Holy Spirit of course was inspiring him to write those words and then here a few Years later, Jesus says he has something against them because they've left their first love and aren't doing the first works. Now, to me, as I study the Word of God, our first love is that original passion we have for Jesus when we're saved. I mean, it's just amazing. If, you, if you've been born again and if you think back to that moment that you realize that your sins were forgiven, and you could almost feel a tangible presence lifting that weight of sin off your shoulders or off your chest. And you felt that love that God has for every one of us touch your life. And all of a sudden you were just surrounded by this warmth that was the love of God. And you had such a passion for the Lord. And what was the first thing you wanted to do? You wanted to tell somebody. You wanted to share that good news with somebody else. It was just too good to keep to yourself. It's kind of like the apostles said when they were brought before the court system. They said, we can't help but say what we've seen and heard. We can't help but do that. And when a person is first saved and, and they're truly born again, that's the first thing they want to do is tell somebody else. They want to see their friends, their families come to know this same joy and this same forgiveness and this same wonder. That's what we call salvation. So Jesus is writing that church, and he said, you've left that first passion, that first love, and you're not doing those first works. Now think with me for a minute. The Bible says that the church is the body of Christ. So we're actually his body in the world today. And the church, of course, is made up of different individual groups that are all parts of that body. And when you realize that the church is a body, you can begin to relate that to a human body. Now, we all know that sleep is a necessary thing. Because while you sleep, your body repairs itself. Your body heals itself, and, 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 and you're restored. But if there's too much sleep, then there's a problem. If somebody sleeps all the time, then there's a sickness. There's some kind of something that's going on that's not right. So if someone is asleep pretty much all the time, then there's some kind of illness that's related to it. Interesting if you read a lot of things about health. I, was saying, I saw an article that this particular scientist said, you know, I'm firmly convinced that 90% of the illnesses that we encounter are a result of nutrition. 90% of the illnesses that we encounter are the results of our 
nutritional situation. In other words, it's that I will say, and you are what you eat, right? And if you live on junk food, then there's going to be problems. And if you continue to feed on things that raise your cholesterol and your blood pressure and on and on, then sickness is going to be the result. So if we think of the church like a human body, and the church is asleep as Paul was writing to the Ephesians, and as Jesus was saying, you got a problem, then there was a sickness that produced that sleepiness. And I'm totally convinced that the church in America has the same affliction. Most of the church in this nation, from God's perspective, is asleep. And they're asleep because they're sick. I was praying about that as God began to show me these things. And I said, well, what's producing the illness? Is it sin? Is it whatever? And, of course, the, you know, the wages of sin is death, of course. But God showed me something else. He said, there's something else that's contributing to this sleeping sickness that the American church has. And he says it's their nutrition. They're feeding on junk food. Junk food is something that makes you feel good real quick. I mean, what is better than a great big greasy hamburger from City Drive-In and Spruce Pine? I mean, it just don't get no better than that for instant gratification, right? One of those city burgers or, you know, the jumbo Angus burger with, a, you know, large fries, you know. <laughs> it makes you feel good right then. You sit down and eat a pack of Oreos. That's instant gratification. And the problem is the church has been doing the same thing. We want teachings and messages that make us feel good. We want something that will tell us how that God wants to bless us with wealth and prosperity. And if we will do this, and if we will give to this particular ministry, and if we'll invest in this, man, we are going to have it all. We want messages that make us feel good instantly. Now, let me tell you something. When we fall ill in this world, short of a miracle of God, there are no instant cures. Right? If you come down with pneumonia or if you come down with some kind of infection, the doctor says antibiotics. Right? And I can guarantee you, other than God reaching down and touching you, that first pill that you take will not immediately cure the problem. It takes a while. But we as Christians in this nation particularly, we want it right now. We want something that will make us feel good. And here's the problem. The problem is when we come to church, stop and think with me. Why do we come to church? We come to church to have our needs met. Right? We do. Do your head like this. We do. I know because I'm one of you, right? We come to church and we come to God because what can you do for me? But it's like that song says, it's not about us, it's about Him. We should be coming to church to worship Him, to give thanks to Him, to pray that His will would be done in and through us, that His kingdom would be built that the body of Christ would be built the lost would be saved that's why we should come now am I saying that God does not want to meet your needs no I'm not saying that but remember what Jesus said he said but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you God wants us to put him first because he is the only one worthy to be put first our problem in this nation is we are so self-centered and self-focused that we lose track, even as Christians, of what we should be and how we should live and what the whole thing is about. The reason the American church is so sleepy is because of their nutrition. It's because what we feed on. We have feel-good sermons. We have bless-me sermons. We have what-can-be-done-for-me sermons. And we are not feeding on the meat of the Word that Steve talked about earlier. We've got to have a change of diet if we're going to come out of sleep and wake up. Our focus must be on Him and not on ourselves. 
Let's think for a minute about the original church, the one in the book of Acts. The Bible tells us in many places that they came together to pray and they went out to preach. They came together to pray and they went out to preach. We have it backwards, don't we? We come together to preach and most of the praying is done somewhere else if there's much done at all. Jesus said, my house will be what? A house of prayer for all nations. We have got it backwards. You know, we talk about a desperate need for revival, a desperate need for the move of God in this nation. We long to see an outpouring of the Spirit of God. That's what we say. But here's the thing. In order for that to happen, the church is going to have to be awakened. And for the church to be awakened, we're going to have to change what we hear and what we feed on. We've got to stop seeking messages and teachings that increase our selfishness. And the reason the church is powerless is because they are anemic from a lack of prayer. This is not one of those, by the way, if you haven't figured this out, this is not one of the bless me sermons. It's a good one, not because I came up with it, because God is giving it through me, I pray. But it's what we need. So many times we don't want what we need, we want what we want, right? Oh, man, I would much rather come to church and have somebody do a good bless me sermon and pray for me and say, son, don't worry about it. You're going to be prosperous. You're going to, I mean, you, you know, you give to God. And there's just going to be this flood of financial blessing that's going to come into your life. Yeah, man, that would, that'd be good. We could go home skipping and dancing. But instead, what we need to do is come to church and hear a message that convicts our hearts of sin a message that convicts us of being asleep, a message that convicts us of not being about our Father's business, a message that convicts us because our hearts aren't broken for a lost and dying world. That's what we need to hear. Amen? Amen. Okay. That's not one of those you shout too much hallelujah about, but it's what we need to hear. It's kind of like when you go to the doctor and you have an infection and he says, well, <laughs> you know, this, this place is really looking not good. We're going to have to go in there and take that out. And we say, uh-uh, that hurts. But unless the infection is removed, folks, you're not going to get better. And unless God deals with us where we need to be dealt with, we're not going to get better either. And neither is this world. Because, as I've said before, I believe that the future of this nation sits squarely on the shoulders of the body of Christ. Amen. Why do I say that? Because of his promise. If my people, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. It's on our shoulders, folks. The course of this nation the future of this nation is resting on our shoulders. And that's why the church in this nation must awake and we must put on strength. And the only way we're going to awake is to change our diet and begin to feed on the things that convict our hearts. The things that motivate us into repentance and doing something about our condition. And then begin to get into the presence of God and pray until our anemic condition is gone and we receive the power of God through the Holy Spirit. Somebody needs to say amen about here. Thank you. All right. Now, let me ask you a question. What were the disciples doing in preparation for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? They're praying, right? That's what the Bible says. Get into Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2. The Bible says they continued with one accord with prayer and supplication. All of the disciples together, there was about 120 of them at this time. And then when you get over in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, it says on the, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They were praying again, and God began to pour out the power on them. Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be my witnesses. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Our problem is that one, we're asleep, and number two, we have no power. The Bible talks about 
having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Folks, listen, the church in America and most of the first world nations is asleep and anemic. And we're going to have to change what we feed on. And listen, while I'm here, I might as well throw this in too. We're feeding on messages and sermons that make us feel good. And we're also feeding on the world that waters down what we do here. We've got to change our diet. The other thing is we've got to get in the presence of God and change the house of God from a place of social get-together, a place of even just preaching and teaching, to a house of prayer. That's why. That's why I want to have prayer on a Super Bowl Sunday. Okay? That's why I want to come here at 6 o'clock tonight and get in the presence of God. Because, folks, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of anemic conditions in me and in the body of Christ. We've got to return to that place of prayer. How did Jesus stay in his Father's will? By praying. The Bible talks about how he would go out by himself on a mountain and pray all night. I know that's a horrible thought to most of us. Most of us have a fit praying for more than five minutes. There's so many things that, you know, grab for our attention. Jesus prayed all night. That's why he knew what the Father was doing. Remember what he said? He said, I only do what I see my Father do. Well, how did he see that? In prayer, he would get before his Father and spend that time in his presence. And they had such a communion that he knew exactly what his Father wanted done. Remember, Jesus was walking this earth as a human being, dependent on the Holy Spirit And dependent on the guidance of his father. How did Jesus stay strong? You can see that account in the garden of Gethsemane. This before his arrest and crucifixion. The Bible says he goes into the garden of Gethsemane. And he takes some of his disciples with him. And they go and he tells them to watch and pray. And he goes a little further. And he falls down on his face and begins to cry out to God. And he said, Father, if there's any other way. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, Not my will, but thine be done. He comes back. The disciples have gone to what? Sleep. (laughs) They got a problem. They're afraid. They're they're not fully mature. and, And they're dealing with it by going to sleep. He goes and he begins to pray again. Same prayer. And he comes back and they're asleep again. And he says, couldn't you watch with me one hour? And he goes back and prays again. And the Bible says there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. The Bible says that the angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister on the behalf or to those who are saved. Folks, I tell you what, I believe if we'd get in the presence of God and begin to pray and cry out to him, that we'd have angelic visitation that would minister to us and that would help us and guide us and strengthen us. I'm not telling you that we worship angels. I'm telling you we worship God and God sends angels to minister to his people. How did Peter receive his directions to go to the Gentiles to tell them about Jesus. The Bible says he was up on the rooftop praying, and God gave him a vision. How was Peter set free from prison? The church was praying without ceasing. You remember that? Peter's arrested. church is off praying. God sends what? An angel. And an angel sets Peter free. How did the church receive their guidance? The Bible says in the book of Acts, we, you know, we need to read that about once a month. The church was praying. The Holy Spirit spoke, said, separate these for me. I'm going to send them somewhere. How were the enemies of the church dealt with? The church was praying. And God did miracle after miracle. I love that story of where Paul and Silas are arrested and they're in the middle of the prison. The jailer's been told them to keep them safe or it's his life for theirs. And at midnight, what are they doing? They're praying and singing praise to God. God sends an earthquake. Doors fly open, chains fall off. The jailer comes in, and he and his household are saved. Folks, if the church will get back on their knees before God, God will do wonders for the church. God will do miracles for the church. And God will have some of the enemies of the church saved. Can you imagine Can you imagine what would happen if some of those strong, outspoken uh, enemies of the church that that are, you know, doing everything to hinder the gospel? Can you imagine what would happen if they got saved 
And like Paul became a strong proponent of what they had been decrying. Wouldn't that be amazing? Folks, God can do it. If he's done it once, he'll do it again. He's no respecter of persons. And you can go on and on throughout the word of God. You'll find out that when God's people pray, God's hand moves. When God's people pray, God's hand moves. If we want to see revival, if we want to see a move of God in this nation, two things have to happen. The church has to come out of their coma. The church has to be awakened out of their sleep. We have to get rid of the sickness that's crippling us. And we have to return to being a house of prayer. If we will become that praying church again, then that power of the Holy Spirit will be upon us. We'll be full of the Holy Spirit and God's supernatural power will move on our behalf. Now, as I said, a lot of times and most of the time, the church in this nation has it backwards. We come together to preach and we go out and pray somewhere else in our homes, hopefully. But God wants that reversed. He wants us to come together and pray. And then when we're out, we can preach to those that need preaching. That doesn't mean we never teach. It doesn't mean we don't study the Word of God here. But the emphasis has to return to prayer. If we're going to see God's hand move, it has to come back to that. It's amazing as you read the history of revivals down through the years. One of the greatest revivalists that ever existed, I believe, was Charles Finney. And Charles Finney had an almost scientific approach to revival. He said revival is not a miracle at all. He said it's like a crop of wheat. He said if you go out and you find good soil and you till that soil and you sow the right seed, you're going to have a good crop of wheat. And he said, if you want to have revival, then what you've got to do is get before God and let that soil, that hardened soil of your heart be stirred up. Break up that fallow ground and you repent before God and then you begin to become that person of prayer. And he said, the revival will result. Down through the years, if you look at every move of God from Pentecost on down, it began the same way. It began when God put on somebody's heart the need for revival and then put on that person's heart to begin to repent before God and to begin to pray. One of the great revivals, of course, in the early 1900s was the Welch Revival. And it started out with one young man in his mid-20s getting a burden for the nation of Wales or the island of Wales. And he, was, he looked at the condition of his country, and his heart was broken. And God put this burden on him, and he began to pray, and he began to repent before God. And he gathered some teenagers with him, just a small group. And they got together, and they began to pray. And the more they prayed, the more they wanted to pray. And all of a sudden, revival fell, and almost the whole nation turned to God. People would run out into the streets repenting. There was long periods of time when there was not a single court case to be tried. They gave the judges white gloves indicating that nothing was to be done. It was symbolic. People were getting saved in the taverns. People were getting saved in the places where they worked. People were getting saved in their homes, in the streets, and in the churches. And it was all because somebody got a burden for the country. And they began to repent, and they began to pray. And listen, it wasn't the lost, it was the saved people that did this. So hear me today. We've got to get a burden for our nation. We've got to get a burden for our state and our county and our town and our community. We've got to start looking around and seeing the condition with, you know, with a clear vision, the condition that's all around us. All you have to do is pick up the newspaper and look at the arrests for drugs and, and larceny and all the different things. Look at the meth labs, all these things that are happening here, not off somewhere in New York or Miami or, or wherever. It's, it's here, folks. And the cure for it is not more law enforcement. The cure for it is not more arrests. The cure for it is a change of heart. And the only thing that brings a change of heart is an encounter with Jesus Christ. 
And the only thing that's going to bring that is for a move of God's Spirit. And what's going to bring a move of God's Spirit is the people of God repenting for their deadness and their selfishness and get on their face before Him and begin to cry out to God. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Think about this with me. When the the tabernacle in the wilderness was dedicated, when Solomon's temple was dedicated, and the presence of God filled the place, The Bible says that fire came down and consumed the sacrifice. And it indicated that God was pleased and it indicated that he was there. But think about what happened at Pentecost. The fire came down, but it was on the believers. Now what does that tell you? It tells you what Paul said in Romans chapter 12. He said this. Present yourselves a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, the sacrifice is us, the believer. Now, sacrifice is something that's offered up to God, right? I mean, when a a lamb was placed on the altar, the lamb didn't like it. When we offer ourselves up to the Lord and become that living sacrifice, the old man part of us says, I don't like this. I don't want to do this. We are jealous of our time. We want to do what we want to do. We want to live our life the way we want to live it. We've got work to do. We've got hobbies that we like. We want to, you know, whatever. Watch the Super Bowl. We want to do all this stuff. And we don't want to sacrifice any of our time. But let me tell you something. The Bible says that we as the children of God are a living sacrifice unto Him. And if we want to see this world changed, if we want to see the course of a nation changed, if we want to see the lost saved, if we want to see America saved, then we have to become that sacrifice that God says that we are, and we have to present ourselves before Him. What did Jesus say? He said, if any man will come after me, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. What was the cross? It wasn't a cute pendant that hangs around your neck. The cross was something that someone was nailed to and gave their life. What was Jesus talking about? He said, look, if you want to be my disciples, if you want to see my power, if you want to see the world change, then you're going to have to deny some of those things in your life and give me some room. Hey, I'm like everybody else. I like to go home and sit down and rest. I like Sunday afternoon to be quiet and peaceful, kick back, you know, just do whatever. God says, look, wait a minute. First thing you've got to remember is this. The Sabbath is my day. It's set apart for me. The other thing is this. You are not your own. You're bought with a price. And it was a tremendous price, wasn't it? It was the blood of the Son of God. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So the question comes back to us. Do we really want to see a move of God? Do we really want to see the lost saved? Do we really want our family members that don't know Jesus to be delivered from drugs, to be born again, to be set free from addictions? Do we want to see homes that are broken apart, restored? Do we want to see multitudes of of the lost come to the Lord? Do we want to see the sick healed? If we do... There is a simple solution. It's not an easy solution, but it's a simple one. Do what God said. Repent and pray. The ingredients of revival. Study it. You'll see it's the truth. Repent and pray. So my prayer is this. That God will begin to awake the sleeping church. You know, when God showed Ezekiel that valley of dry bones, he said, can it live? And Ezekiel said, you're the only one that knows. 
God said, you begin to prophesy. In other words, speak my word over those dry bones and watch what happens. And when he began to deliver the message that God placed on him, there was a stirring. And folks, we need a stirring, don't we? He began to proclaim what God told him to proclaim, and those bones began to come together, and they began to make what they were supposed to be. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to be, begin to proclaim what God has told us to proclaim. You know, the Bible says in the last days, people will not endure sound doctrine. They don't want to hear good teaching. They want to hear something that makes them feel good. But that results in selfishness, and that is a sickness. And that sickness results in that sleepy condition. But he said, Ezekiel, you tell those bones what I tell you to tell them. And they came together. And then he said, call for the Holy Spirit. Call for the wind. And he did, and they the wind entered into them, and they began to live again. They stood on their feet, an exceeding great army. I believe Satan's greatest fear is that the church will wake up and that the Spirit of God will animate them, and they'll stand up and be that army that terrifies him. That's his greatest fear. But I believe with all my heart it's going to happen. God is stirring the hearts of people. And God is beginning to motivate people to preach the message that he has called them to preach rather than what people would like to hear. And God is calling us to prayer. A prayerless condition is a weak condition. We've all seen that little, that little plaque that says seven days without prayer makes one weak, W-E-A-K. Folks, let me tell you something. We don't pray like we used to pray. Not to the intensity, not to the degree, but we've got to if we want to see a nation turn around. Folks, the news should cause every one of us to tremble. We look at the economic news. We see the stock market in in such a perilous condition. We see, uh, you know, the the Fed, quote, unquote, so shaky. We see all these things. We see financial turmoil and and tremors going all over the world whether it's in China or the European Union or wherever it is everything is hanging in the balance and it's hanging by a thread we have to remember what God said seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you God can take care of his people and God will take care of his people if we'll put him first if we'll do what he's called us to do, if we will return to our first love, if we will repent and do the first works again. That first love is our passion for him, and the first works are making sure that everybody hears the good news that Jesus forgives and Jesus saves. And your sin is paid for if you will accept the sacrifice of his son. That's the first works, getting the lost saved. So, folks, here we are. Now, we as people of God have to make a decision. We have to make the decision, are we going to satisfy ourselves, or are we going to fulfill the commission that's been given to us? For a long time, the church has been living too much like the world. Our obligation, we think, is to come to church for an hour or two on Sunday morning, and then the rest of the time is ours. Well, That's not what the Word says, and that's not what God's heart is. You see, He doesn't want to just take up your time because He's selfish. He wants your time because He knows that when you're in His presence, you're protected. When you're in His presence, there's fullness of joy. When you're in His presence, He can minister to you. When you're in His presence, He can convey to you what you need to know. And when you're in his presence, you can fulfill what he has called you to do. God has a great big heart. The Bible says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He came into this world to seek and to save that which was lost. And our commission is to take the good news that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life to take that to the world where the world is right outside that door or on the other side of this earth. But before we can do that, we have to wake up and we have to be empowered. 
And we have to begin to get into his presence. And let that anemic condition be cured as we cry out to him in prayer. So I urge you this morning, be honest with God. All of us have to be. Be honest with him and let him know how you feel. And if your time and your life and your desires are more important right now than his commission, I urge you repent. Because he gave for us the most precious thing that heaven had. The only begotten son of God. And Jesus took his time, climbed down from his throne, left the place of absolute joy and beauty and glory and descended to this earth, became a human being, born in a barn, lived as the adopted son of a carpenter, had no possessions except the the garment that he wore and the sandals on his feet, had to borrow something to travel in, whether it be a boat or a donkey, and was buried in a borrowed tomb. The one who owned all the universe was willing to become poor that we might become rich through him. Now, he was willing to do that. What are we willing to do? Are we willing to deny ourselves and take some of our precious time and give it to him in prayer and in going after the lost and fulfilling and doing the first works? Or are we going to be that anemic, sleeping, selfish church that so characterizes this nation? The choice is ours, but it's a choice we have to make. No wonder, no wonder Paul wrote these words, and let me read them to you again. Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See that you walk exactly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding What the will of the Lord is. What's his will? That we be that living sacrifice. That we be his ambassadors. His witnesses. That we allow him through us to build the body of Christ. What are we going to do about it? The choice is ours. And it's a choice that we have to make. Would you bow your heads? Father, I have to ask your forgiveness today because I'm like so much of the body of Christ. I love my time and I love to do what I want to do. But Lord, that's not what I'm called to do. I'm called to be a living sacrifice. Holy, and that word means set apart for you, for your use. And Lord, for a lot of my life, I've been selfish. And I've allowed myself to do pretty much what I want to do. But Lord, the time has come for me and every other child of God to make a choice. Either we're going to be obedient, humble, And yielded to you. Or we're going to be like that church at Ephesus. That you said I have somewhat against you. Because you've left your first love. It's time to repent and do the first works again. And Lord it's so, so time. We as the body of Christ have allowed this nation. To get into the condition that it's in. We've allowed prayer to be taken from the schools. We've allowed the Ten Commandments to be removed from the courthouse. We've allowed those to be an authority that deny you and inform us that our nation is no longer a Christian nation. And it's all on our shoulders. Simply because we've not done what you called us to do. We've not been the people that prayed daily for those in authority. We've not been the people that stood in the gap for our nation we've not been the people that cried out to you and agonized in prayer for revival for a move of God 
and we've allowed ourselves to be lulled into slumber and we're at ease in Zion and asleep in the light. I confess that today for myself and for the body of Christ in the United States. And Lord, I ask your forgiveness. And I ask you to send upon us, us meaning the U.S., the church in America. I ask you to send a spirit of repentance. I ask you to send a spirit of prayer. I ask you to send your heart and your mind that is so grieved for the lost, those that will open their eyes in hell if they're not saved. Those that will spend eternity in a place of punishment with no hope of reprieve unless they come to know Jesus. And as you said, how will they know? How can they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how will they hear without someone to tell them? God, I pray, wake your body. God, anoint your messengers that they preach what you say and not what people want to hear. And I pray that you put a hunger to see the lost saved. I pray that you place within us a desire to have America return to her roots, her foundation. And I pray that you put within us a hunger to see God move in power and might, signs and wonders, so that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, Lord, forgive us. You said if we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive that sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, I ask you to do that. Now, Father, I love this body of believers so much. And, Lord, I have to share with them what you shared with me. And I put them in your hands this day, and I ask you to do in them what needs to be done. In every one of our lives, Father, do what needs to be done that we might be that living sacrifice. That revival might come to this nation. That you might find that number of people that stand before you that you would, just, that you would not destroy the land. God, I pray that you find them. Father, I pray for every person in this, in this building today. And if there's anyone here that does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, if there's anyone here today that has been saved but's no longer in right relationship with God, let this be the moment that the Holy Spirit would convict their heart. And I pray that you would grant them the gift of repentance and help them to return to you. And I'm so thankful that you're the God that says, Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And Lord, those that are listening by radio or watching by television, Lord, whoever does not know you, I pray that the Holy Spirit would touch their hearts right now. And Lord, that they would be convicted of their sin and know their need for a Savior. And they would pray that simple prayer that says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I confess my sin. I confess that I have fallen short of what you require. And Lord, I want to be forgiven. I want to be saved. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He came and lived and died and rose again, and He did it for me. So I ask Jesus to come into my heart and be my Savior, and I give my life to Him. I commit my life into Your hands, Lord. I believe. And Lord, I know that if they'll pray that prayer, they will be saved. Lord, stir Your church. Awake those that sleep. Give us a spirit of prayer. Lord, I thank you that you are a merciful, long-suffering God. But the time has come for choice. Help us to choose your way. I ask it in the precious, matchless name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen.